Church family, I invite you to open up in your copy of God's Word to the book of Genesis. Genesis chapter 16 is our text for today. The title of our message is Waiting Well. Waiting Well. Genesis chapter 16, verses 1 through 16. I'm going to read from God's Word. You follow along in your copy as I read. This is the Word of God. Now Sarai, Abram's wife, had borne him no children. She had a female Egyptian servant whose name was Hagar. And Sarai said to Abram, Behold now, the Lord has prevented me from bearing children. Go into my servant. It may be that I shall obtain children by her. And Abram listened to the voice of Sarai. So after Abram had lived ten years in the land of Canaan, Sarai, Abram's wife, took Hagar, the Egyptian, her servant, and gave her to Abram, her husband, as a wife. And he went into Hagar, and she conceived. And when she saw that she had conceived, she looked with contempt on her mistress. And Sarai said to Abram, May the wrong done to me be on you. I gave my servant to your embrace, and when she saw that she had conceived, she looked on me with contempt. May the Lord judge between you and me. But Abram said to Sarai, Behold, your servant is in your power to do to her as you please. Then Sarai dealt harshly with her, and she fled from her. The angel of the Lord found her by a spring of water in the wilderness, the spring on the way to Shur. And he said, Hagar, servant of Sarai, where have you come from and where are you going? She said, I am fleeing from my mistress Sarai. The angel of the Lord said to her, return to your mistress and submit to her. The angel of the Lord also said to her, I will surely multiply your offspring so that they cannot be numbered for multitude. And the angel of the Lord said to her, behold, you are pregnant and shall bear a son. You shall call his name Ishmael, because the Lord has listened to your affliction. He shall be a wild donkey of a man, his hand against everyone, and everyone's hand against him, and he shall dwell over against all his kinsmen. So she called the name of the Lord, who spoke to her, You are a God of seeing. For she said, Truly, here I have seen him who looks after me. Therefore the well was called Bir Lahai Roy, it lies between Kadesh and Bered. And Hagar bore Abram a son. And Abram called the name of his son, whom Hagar bore Ishmael. Abram was 86 years old when Hagar bore Ishmael to Abram. This is the word of the Lord for his church today. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, would you bless our time in your word? Father, would you open up our hearts and impress the truth of your word deep inside of us, expose any sin that needs to be exposed, encourage us, strengthen us, change us, O God, by the power of your Holy Spirit, by your grace. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. How many of you are great at being patient? Hurry up and answer. Come on, hurry up, hurry up, hurry up, hurry up. We don't have all day. Hurry up and answer. All right, I see some, I see some brave souls that have admitted it. As someone once said, I would have patience if I only had the time for it. If you're like me, patience is hard to come by. <laughs> Not just sometimes for me, oftentimes. Patience is hard to come by. And even if it comes easier to you than it does to me, it does not come naturally to any of us. At least not the kind of patience that brings God honor and glory. It doesn't come natural to any of us. There is a reason that patience is listed as part of the fruit of the Spirit in Paul's letter to the Galatians. It's listed as part of the fruit of the Spirit is because it can only come supernaturally to us. It can only come through the heart-transforming work of God in rescuing us from our sin, including the sin of impatience, and through the work of that Holy Spirit then helping us display spirit-like behavior, God-honoring behavior in our lives. But the good news is that God has sent his son to rescue us from our sin, including that sin of impatience. He's sent his son so that we can be filled with the very presence of God, so that we can have God fill our hearts with the Holy Spirit, with his presence in us, so that we can live the way that God has called us to live. Now, there are a lot of opportunities in life for us to ex exercise patience. 
Every time it uh, seems like I mention patience or preach on patience, there's some of you that say, say all right, stop preaching on patience, don't talk about it, because it seems like the next week God, God gives me all sorts of opportunities to be patient. Um, and uh, I'd rather not have all those opportunities where I need to exercise patience. Sometimes that is how it seems to work. Think about all the things in life that require patience. Driving, whew, that requires patience, okay? Driving requires patience. Being married requires patience. And what I mean by that is being married to me, okay, um, requires patience. It doesn't work the other way um, at all. Um, um, raising children requires lots and lots and lots of patience. Waiting uh, at the doctor's office. You with me on that? Sometimes lots of patience. Waiting on test results. Patience. How many of you keep checking my chart, right? When are they going to post them? When are they going to post them? Um, or when's the doctor going to call? Waiting on those test results. Going to a restaurant requires patience. Sometimes lots of patience. You take kids to a restaurant that's understaffed. Lots and lots and lots of patience, right? All kinds of opportunities for patience. But those are just, those are human to human opportunities for patience. What about in our relationship with God? Are there opportunities for us to exercise patience? Well, let's think about it first from God's perspective. From God's perspective, he, if he's going to put up with us for any length of time, must exercise an immeasurable amount of patience. Our Lord, thankfully, is slow to anger and abounding in love. He is very, very patient with us. But what about us towards God? Is there, a, is there any room or any way for us with where we would have to be patient towards God. Yes, not in the same way that God is patient toward us. God's patient toward us because we are sinners, and, and, and he has to forbear with our failings. We don't have to do that with God. We don't have to forbear with his failings because he never fails. But there is a way in which God calls us to exercise patience even in our relationship with him. And that's because God's timing and our timing don't always match up. Would you agree with me on that? Our timing and God's timing don't always match up. God makes promises, but sometimes the fulfillment of those promises just don't happen quite as quickly as we would like for them to happen. Church, as we study Genesis 16 today, we learn that faith in God's promises requires patience with God's timing. Faith in God's promises, which we've been talking a lot about as we've been working our way through Genesis and the life of Abraham. But faith in God's promises requires patience with God's timing. In Genesis chapter 12, God called out Abram to leave his country, go to the land of Canaan. God made certain promises to Abram. He promised to, uh, to bless him, to make his name great, to bless him with land, to, to protect him, to bless all the families of the earth through him to give him an offspring. And in Genesis 15, we learned uh, last week that God formalized those promises, promises by making a covenant with Abram. We also learned that Abram believed God, and God counted that faith to Abram as righteousness. Abram believed. He had faith in those promises of God. But God's plan to fulfill his promises to Abram required waiting. They required waiting. And sinners don't often wait well when God requires us to wait. And I include myself in that list of sinners. Abram and his wife need to have patience, but they prove in this passage to have the same kind of problem with showing patience that you and I often have. I like how my wife defines patience. I think I've shared with this, uh, this with you before, but I love how she defines it with our children um, whenever I'm listening, right? Um, you see what I'm saying? Um, she defines it as waiting well. She defines it as waiting well. It's one thing to wait, but sometimes we wait like this. Oh, come on, I'm waiting, I'm waiting, but I'm not waiting well, right? She defines waiting, uh, patience as waiting well. Church, today I want us to grow in learning to wait well whenever God's plan for our lives requires us to have patience. I want us to grow in our faith, and faith in God's promises often requires us to have patience with God's timing. I want, to, I want you to notice with me today three truths from Genesis 16 that I think we can apply to our lives anytime we find ourselves in a position where we are needing to wait, wait on the Lord. 
The first is this, church family, when God's plan requires waiting, we must resist the temptation to step outside of God's plan. We must resist the temptation to step outside of God's plan for us. Verse 1 tells us that Sarai, Abram's wife, had borne him no children. Well, that seems to be a problem from their perspective. It's not a problem from God's perspective because he knows what he's going to do. But from their perspective, that's a problem. Remember, God has not only promised Abram an offspring, but remember last week in chapter 15, he made that promise very specific. He said, no, you're going to have your very own son. You're not going to have to adopt anybody into your family or, 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 or let one of your servants be uh, part of your, uh, your, your, your household, uh, be the heir. You're going to have your very own son. And we learn in this passage that about 10 years has passed since God began making these promises to Abram. And so we see the crisis of faith for Sarah and Abram. God has promised a son, but we know what this feels like. Their patience is wearing thin. Their patience is wearing thin. Church, whenever God's plan requires waiting, we will be tempted to step outside of God's plan. And that's exactly what Sarah and Abram do. They, they, They step outside of God's plan for them. They try to do things their own way. First, we see one of the ways we can be tempted to step outside of God's plan is by aggressively inventing our own way. Well, if it's not happening this way, then I thought God was going to do it. I'm just going to I'm just going to forge my own path. I'm just going to I'm just going to take take this step of initiative and I'm going to do it my own way. And that's what Sarah does. She sees what she thinks is a problem with God's plan. And so she takes matters into her own hands. She invents her own plan. Look at what the text says. It says that she had a female uh, Egyptian servant whose name was Hagar. And Sarai said to Abram, Behold, now the Lord has prevented me from bearing children. Go into my servant, that it may, be, it, it may be that I shall obtain children by her. So here's Sarai. She says, Don't look like God is doing what he said he was going to do. i got another plan. I've got another plan. She knows that God has promised Abram a son, but she feels like they have waited long enough. So she's going to give her servant to her husband, so that he can have a child with her servant. And then she says, in this way, I'm going to have a son. Remember that, because we're going to come back to that, to that statement at the end. Now, this practice seems to have been, if we go back and look at this time in history, seems to have been sometimes a common practice um, in that day and time. But just because something is a common practice in the culture in which we live does not mean that is God's design for us. They are stepping maybe into cultural norms of that day, but they are stepping outside of God's original design for that marriage relationship. We know that from Genesis chapter 2 and the rest of the Bible, that this behavior does not align with God's plan for marriage, and never in this passage is, is it, um, it, it, are they congratulated by the Lord on this decision that they made. In fact, what we see is it simply brings turmoil into their lives. In her impatience, Sarai stepped out of God's plan by aggressively inventing her own way. You ever grow tired sometimes of waiting? You ever grow tired sometimes of waiting on God? It seems like he's not doing what you think he should be doing. And so you just say, you know what? I'll just, I'll just do things my way. What that reveals is a lack of patience on our part. It, it, it re- reveals a lack of waiting well on our, far, on our part. It, 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 it reveals a lack of faith. Remember this theme of faith as we're walking through this. It, there's this struggle, it's this constant battle. Of, am I going to trust in the Lord? Am I not going to trust in the Lord? I mean, chapter 15, Abram's believing God and God's crediting him with righteousness, and now they're not trusting the Lord. But that's what happens in times of waiting. We're tempted to step outside of God's plan. That temptation is very real. But there's another way we can be tempted to step outside of God's plan. It's not simply by being aggressive and saying, oh, I'm going I'm to do it my way, which is what Sarai seems to be doing. We can also passively step outside of God's plan. And that's what Abram does. Abram's not aggressively saying, all right, let's invent a new way. Let's come up with a, with a new way. He simply complies. He simply goes along with the plan of his wife. He passively listens to the wrong authority. Look at the end of verse 2. It says, and Abram listened to the voice of Sarai. Abram listened to the voice of Sarai. Now, before, before any husbands in here decide that their application is, of this is not to ever listen to their wives, that's not the point. 
Sarai's plan is not honoring the Lord. And Abram needs to remember who his authority is. It's God. And he should be listening to the voice of God. That voice back in chapter 15 that said, I'm going to give you a son. But instead, he listens to his wife. He complies. He steps outside of God's plan. God's creation order, I think it is worth noting here, because one of the things we see as we walk through scriptures, we see examples of how to live and how not to live, and we see that God's way always is the best way, and we know back from Genesis chapter 2 that God's plan for the family is that the husband would be the head of the wife. That's the way God intends for it to work and for, for, for this relationship to work well, but we see those roles being reversed here. And now Abram is passively following the lead of his wife who is impatiently forging her own way outside of God's plan and it all ends up in a mess. I wonder today if you're in a season of waiting if you've been tempted to step outside of God's plan. Maybe aggressively by just saying I'm going to do it my way or maybe passively by going along with someone else's plan. But either way we're guilty whether we're aggressively stepping outside of God's plan or passively stepping outside of God's plan, we're guilty of not having faith in the Lord if we just try to do it our own way. And that's exactly what Satan wants. That's exactly what Satan, our enemy, wants for you and for me. He wants those seasons of waiting be times where we stumble in our faith and we grow impatient, and we look away from God's goodness, and we say, I'm going to do it my way. Because he hates us, and he knows that God's way is always best, and so he would much rather us choose our own way, because he knows that's going to lead to destruction in our lives. He tempts us to doubt God's good plan, and then to step outside of God's good plan by taking matters into our own hands, or simply going with the flow of those around us. I want you to look at verse 3 for a moment. And I want you to see if this reminds you of another story in God's word. Listen, things don't change. We see these patterns over and over. See if this sounds like another story from God's word. Verse 3 here. So after Abram had lived 10 years in the land of Canaan, Sarai, Abram's wife, took Hagar, the Egyptian, her servant, and gave her to Abram, her husband, as a wife. Is Is that making your ears perk up a little bit? You thinking about maybe, maybe another place in God's word where something very similar happened? The woman is tempted to believe that God's plan is not good. She decides to do things her way. Then she enlists her passive husband in her rebellion by taking something forbidden and giving it to him, and he goes along with it. Let me read to you from Genesis chapter 3. Now the serpent was more crafty than any other beast of the field that the Lord had made. He said to the woman, did God actually say, here comes the doubting, did God actually say you shall not eat of any tree in the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, we may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden, but God said you shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that's in the midst of the garden, neither shall you touch it lest you die. But the serpent said to the woman, you will not surely die, for God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be open and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So he, he's, he's tempting the woman to doubt that God's provision in their lives is good, that God's somehow holding out on them. And then what happens? So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was a delight to the eyes and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, here's her plan. She took of its fruit and ate, and she also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate. Eve took and gave. Sarai took and gave gave. Adam passively complied. Abram passively complied. And Satan loves it. He loves it. And not surprisingly, the results are very similar. Not blessing, but turmoil. Look at verses 4 through 6. Just, I just want you to, I just want you to see the the nastiness of it, like the dirtiness of sin, just how it just brings just unnecessary turmoil into our lives. There's no peace. There's no blessing here. It's just a mess, okay? 
and he went into Hagar, and she conceived, and when she saw that she had conceived, everybody's happy, right? No. She looked with contempt on her mistress, and Sarai said to Abram, may the wrong be done to me, be on you. Now they're having a marital argument, and, 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 and Abram's getting blamed and, uh, for what Sarah did, and they're really all to blame. I gave my servant to your embrace, and when she saw that she had conceived, she looked on me with contempt. May the Lord judge between you and me. But Abram said to Sarah, I behold, your servant's in your power. You do to her as you please, and then they all lived happily ever after, right? No. Now Sarai dealt harshly with Hagar, and Hagar has to run away. It's a mess. It's what sin does in our lives. It's what happens when we take matters into our own hands. Notice what happened. Hagar turns on Sarai. She now looks with contempt on Sarai. Sarai turns on Abram, and Abram turns on Hagar. They just got it going in circles, right? It's just some nastiness of sin just, just spiraling in this family now. Probably what it means that Hagar looks with contempt on Sarah probably means that she kind of got a little bit of arrogant. That, hey, I got pregnant and you didn't. No, that's not going to sit well. So Sarai gets angry. Now she's blaming Abram. And she even has, notice what she says, may the Lord judge between me and you. Sarai, who has invented her own plan, stepped outside of God's plan, now has the audacity to sound like she is a champion for righteousness by calling God down to judge between her and Abram. God's going to, God will judge between us and it'll prove that you're in the wrong and not me. I mean, it's, 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 it's chaos, it's a mess. And then Abram continues in his passivity, he's just sitting on his hands, and he, he just says, well, just do, do to her whatever you want to do to her. Obviously, he knew that it wasn't going to end well for Hagar. Church, stepping outside of God's plan may look good on the outside, but it always leads to destruction rather than blessing. It led to pain and turmoil for Adam and Eve. It led to pain and turmoil for Sarah and, um, and Abram. Hagar kind of included in all of that. And it's going to lead to pain and turmoil for you and me in our lives. Satan has hated God's plan for humanity since the garden, and he is going to do everything in his power to tempt us to step outside of God's plan. And one of the times that he does that, and sometimes it's a time where it's subtle, we're not really on guard against it, is in those moments of waiting when our patience is wearing thin. And so we've got to resist that temptation to take matters into our own hands whenever God's timing is not our timing. We've got to learn to wait well. We've got to learn to walk by faith, even in that waiting. But I want to share with you another truth, another, another, another thing that we can put into practice in those times of waiting well. Not only do we need to um, resist that temptation to forge our own way, but we also must allow God's personal presence to direct our focus to him, to put our focus back on him. What often happens in those moments when our patience is wearing thin is our focus is simply on our circumstances that things aren't happening how we thought they were going to happen. But what we really need to be focused on is our God. That's where our gaze needs to be fixed. And that's what we see really throughout the rest of this passage. In verses 7 through 14, the text zooms in on Hagar. Hagar's running away. She's probably running for her life. She flees from Sarai. She begins to make her way back to Egypt, looking at the geography here. She's probably made it a, a few days' journey away from where they live. Uh, she's headed back down to Egypt, where she's from. And we're told in verse 7 that the angel of the Lord found her. Isn't that awesome that the Lord sought her out? The angel of the Lord found her by a spring of water in the wilderness, a spring on the way to Shur. The first question uh, we might ask then is, who is this angel of the Lord? Four times in verses 7 through 11, we see this phrase, the angel of the Lord, the angel of the Lord, the angel of the Lord, the angel of the Lord. He's speaking uh, with Hagar. But then in verse 13, the text tells us that it was, notice verse 13, the Lord who spoke to Hagar. And what we see as we read the Old Testament that, is that God will graciously appear to people. We're going to see him appear to Abram in, in just a few chapters. But it's often phrased as the angel of the Lord. But what we realize is this is God. This is God appearing to Hagar, speaking with Hagar. Not simply a messenger from God, but God himself there in the form of this angel, this man who is standing there. And he asked Hagar, where, where she's come from? Where are, you, where are you coming from? Where are you going? She tells him she's fleeing from Sarai. She tells him her problems. He invites her to tell him what's going on in her life. He wants to know. He wants to hear it from her. And then he tells her to return to Sarai and to submit to her. 
that's not an easy command for Hagar to obey. Why is she running away? Probably because she's fearful for her life. She's being treated harshly. And God says, turn around and go back and submit to Sarai. He gives her a command that's going to require faith on Hagar's part. It's not easy. And then God makes Hagar a promise. He tells her that he will make her offspring numerous. He gives her insight into the future of this child in her, in her womb. She's pregnant with a boy. She tells him that, uh, he tells her that uh, she needs to name him Ishmael. He's going to be wild. He's going to be a wild man. He's going to be in conflict with everyone, and specifically with his kinsmen. You see that there in verse 12. And as is always the case, if we look ahead in the story and through history, we see that this proves to be true. In Genesis 21, we see conflict between Ishmael and Abram's son Isaac. And in Genesis 25, we're told that Ishmael settled over against all his kinsmen. So she's going to have this wild man for a son, but there's going to be nations that come from him. And as we trace that through history, we see that is true. But the text then draws our attention, it doesn't leave us focused on Ishmael right now. The text draws our attention back to Hagar and the Lord. Back to this encounter between Hagar and God. Look at verse 16. I want you to notice the personal presence of God that Hagar gets to experience. She's to name her son Ishmael, which means God hears, because the Lord has listened to her in her affliction. And, 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 then, and then we know that Hagar was greatly impacted by this encounter. I think I told you to look at verse 16. I'm sorry. I meant to say chapter 16, verse, and then we'll look at 13 and 14. Notice 13 and 14. So she called the name of the Lord who spoke to her. You are a God of seeing. For she said, truly, I have seen him who looks after me. Therefore, the well was called Bir Laha Roy. It lies between Kadesh and Bered. Now, that name in the Hebrew means the well of the living one who sees. So we've got this theme here of God seeing Hagar and Hagar seeing God. In fact, some of, what, some of verse 13 is a little bit difficult to translate in the Hebrew, and it could be that it's really emphasizing more so not God seeing Hagar, but Hagar getting to see God. But either way, we have this, this incredible exchange where God is seeing her and listening to her in her affliction, and Hagar gets this glimpse of the Lord himself. In the midst of her affliction, God visited Hagar. He saw her. He listened to her. But she was also able to see God. Now, she didn't get to see him in all his glory. She wouldn't have lived through that experience. But she does have this grand privilege in the midst of her affliction when she's been given this command that now she's going to have to exercise faith. She's been given a glimpse of God. She has had her gaze focused, redirected back to God, away from her circumstances that she has found herself in. That's God's answer, is to look at me. Let me show you me, God says, in the midst of your affliction. That's how you're going to be able to turn around and in faith go back to Sarah, trusting that I'm going to take care of you. Now, I don't, that she did that. She, she goes back. But I want you to think about this encounter between Hagar and God in light of Abram and Sarai's recent choices. Are they focused on the goodness of God? Nope. Are they focused on the trustworthiness of God? Nope. What are they focused on? They're focused on their circumstances. And their circumstances make it appear as though God has left them to fend for themselves. Their circumstances make it appear as though God's kind of forgotten about them. Their circumstances make it appear that he's not there to listen to them in their uncertainty. It makes it appear that God's not seeing them and, and, and the, the, that their patience is wearing thin, that they're confused about this promise that God's made that doesn't seem to be panning out how they thought it would. And so focused on their circumstances, what did they do? They took matters into their own hands. But the encounter with Hagar is a reminder that God is not distant. He is not impersonal. He hasn't forgotten about him, them just like he hadn't forgotten about Hagar. But rather, he's a compassionate God who hears and sees us and graciously allows us to see him. Now, if say, Abram and Sarai would simply redirect their gaze back to the God of the promise rather than the circumstances that they are in at this moment where it looks like God's not fulfilling his promise to them, if they would look back to the God of their circumstance, and I think they would be able to say, listen, God's way is best. 
He is a good God, and he sees us. He knows that we're waiting. He hasn't forgotten about us. Our eyes are continue to fix on, be fixed on the God who sees us and who hears us. They would have been able to wait well. So, brothers and sisters in Christ, I just want to I I encourage you. If you're in a season of waiting in your life, are your eyes fixed on the Lord, or are they so fixed on your circumstances that you've forgotten about how good and compassionate and kind God is to you? That He is faithful. He always proves faithful. Perhaps you're so focused on your present circumstances and how things are not going the way you thought they would go that you've just lost sight of God and His goodness and His sovereignty, His compassionate nature, His trustworthiness. You've lost sight of the God who's not far off, but is personally present with you through His Holy Spirit who lives in every single person who belongs to Jesus. Listen, if you've trusted in Christ as your Lord and Savior, God lives inside of you. He has not forgotten about you, even though the waiting may seem long. Even though it may seem like you can't be patient another day, He hasn't turned His back on you. He lives in you if you have trusted Him. His presence is very personal. And we need to be reminded that God wants us to keep our gaze fixed upon Him. When our faith is weak, we run back to Him. Now, maybe you ask, all right, so am I supposed to expect the angel of the Lord to appear, (laughs) right? Am I supposed to, how do I see God? Is He going to want to walk out of here today and There he is standing in front of me, the angel of the Lord. No, we don't have that kind of promise in Scripture. But we can see God. We can. And I think we primarily see God through his word. See, God's revealed himself to us in a very clear and very detailed way. We can't know everything about God because our our minds are limited. But we can know a lot about God, and he has revealed those things to us in his word. We can open up God's word, and we can see him. And what Satan wants us to do when we're growing impatient with God's timing is to begin to close this up. All right, I don't, I don't really feel like God is with me in this. And we, and we, we kind of draw back from the Lord. When he has, he has presented himself right in front of us through his word. And yet in our impatience, Satan wants to tempt us to not see God. He doesn't want us to gaze upon the goodness and the sovereignty and the compassion and the trustworthiness of God. And so we're tempted to move away from looking at the Lord. And brothers and sisters, what I want to encourage you is with, the, is, with, with is this. In those moments when our patience is wearing thin, we need to see God. Which means we got, to, we got to open this up and we got to read it on our own. We, we got to make sure, we got to make sure that we're studying it. We got to make sure we're gathering with other believers and studying it together so that we can be encouraged from one another through God's word. That's how we see God. And that's how we keep our hope and our faith in him in those times where our patience is growing thin. And we run to the Lord in those times we see him Our faith is strengthened, and we're able to wait well. So where's your focus today? Has your focus in a season of waiting shifted away from the goodness of God to the difficulty of the circumstance? Maybe today what God is telling you is, get your eyes back on me. Get your eyes back on me. Keep them there. I care about you. I'm hearing you. I'm seeing you, and I'm allowing you to see me. Let me share with you one final reason. Excuse me, not reason, but thing that we can apply to our lives in these seasons of waiting. We want to resist the temptation to step out of God's plan. We want to allow God to direct our focus back to him as he reveals himself to us through his word. And then the last one, this is kind of simple, but it's so important. As we resist the temptation to step outside of God's plan, as we keep our eyes fixed on God, we just got to trust that God's way is worth the wait. We've got to trust that God's way is worth the wait. Satan, again, we go back to the garden, we go back to this, Satan wants us to be tempted to think that Ah, maybe it is good God's way, but man, I can do it another way and it'll be just as good. No, it's not. It's always worth the wait. 
God's way, God's plan is always worth it. The last two verses here, verses 15 and 16, might seem to simply wrap up this part of the story with some less than helpful facts, but I think there's something we need to notice. And what we need to notice in these last two verses is what's not there. We need to notice what's not there. So I'm going to read verses 15 through 16, and as you see what is there, I want you to ask yourself, what's missing from verses 15 and 16? And Hagar bore Abram a son, and Abram called the name of his son whom Hagar bore Ishmael. Abram was 86 years old when Hagar bore Ishmael to Abram. So we see what happens that Hagar goes back, she gives birth to a son, she apparently tells Abram about her encounter with God because he names his son Ishmael, which is the name that God told Hagar to name the son. And we learn that Abram was 86 years old when Hagar bore Ishmael to Abram. We told Abram's age. What's missing? Or should we say who is missing? Sarah is not mentioned. Remember that verse I told you to hold on to at the beginning? Go back to Sarah's plan. Not God's plan, Sarah's plan. Go back to what started all of this. Go back to when Sarah decided to do things her way because she was tired of waiting on God. She wanted her husband to have a child with her servant, and the end result in her mind, this is what she thinks, that her plan is going to lead to, I shall obtain children by her. Another way to translate that is I'm going to be built up. I'm going to be built up. I'm going to have children through, it's, it's, I'm going to be blessed. This is the way that I'm going to receive this blessing from God. But what we see at the end of her plan is that she's still childless. Now she's living in a house that is full of turmoil created by her lack of patience. She's thought that she would be built up, have this child, but when the child comes, she is not even mentioned. She's not there. Not even mentioned. She decided that God's way wasn't worth the wait. She had a plan, and it would result in just as much blessing. But it didn't. She's left out at this part of the story. Now, we're going to see that God's a gracious God later on. But at this point, her end of her plan is not what she envisioned. And it never is. Because we think we can make our own way, step outside of God's plan, and it's going to turn out fine. But it doesn't. It doesn't. God's blessing is found when we wait on him by sticking to his plan, no matter how long we have to wait. And it comes back to faith. Do we trust? Do we trust that God's way is worth the wait? I want to close with two important points, okay? They're going to be brief, but I think it's really important. I can't, I can't close this passage without saying this. One is, is simply a, a warning that we wouldn't learn something from this passage that God never intended for us to learn. That we wouldn't walk away from this passage thinking that somehow um, what we see happening here is the way it happens, is going to happen with all of us. Where, where, for instance, God doesn't promise every single person that they're going to have a child. So we walk away saying, well, they would have waited, they'd have had their child, and so I'm going to wait, and God's going to give that to me. Or, or let me give you another example. God hasn't promised that we're all just going to be healed from whatever sickness we have in this life if we'll just wait and, and, and have, have good patience on God. He's going to heal us this side of heaven. God hasn't promised that. God, God hasn't promised to turn every wayward child back to a life of pleasing God. God hasn't promised to fix every problem of our lives. God hasn't promised to fulfill every wish or dream that we may have. Sometimes those are things that we might wait on, and this is not a prescriptive passage. This isn't telling us exactly what's going to happen in our lives. This is just the scenario that Abram and Sarah found themselves in. We don't want to take from this that, oh, whatever it is I'm waiting on God, he's definitely going to give it to me as long as I just wait and have patience. We don't want to walk away with promise, clinging to promises that God has not made to us. He has made some very good and great promises to us. He has promised to keep us forever. He has promised to complete our salvation. He has promised to never leave us nor forsake us. 
He has promised to walk with us through the trials of life. He has promised to put within us a peace that passes all understanding in the midst of the trials of life. He has made some very good and great promises, even greater than the ones that sometimes we would wish that he would make towards us because we focus on this temporary life. And he has promised us an eternal dwelling with him to make all things new one day, okay? So don't walk away clinging to promises that God hasn't made to you. What's the point of this? The point is that God is worthy of our patience when his timing is not our timing, and whatever that is in our lives. God is worthy of our trust. He is worthy of our faith. So that's the, the one concluding point that I want to make. And I don't want you to walk away clinging to promises that God hasn't made to everyone. But the second concluding point is this. I want us to begin how we started, and that's with a confession. I want us to end how we started, and that is with a confession. Church family, we fail at this. We fail at waiting well. We have failed in the past. We will fail in the future. That's not me just being negative up here. That's me just realizing that we aren't perfect. We fail at waiting well. We often fail at remaining patient and trusting God's timing. But there is one who waited well. In fact, he was perfectly patient as he waited on God's timing. I'm speaking of Jesus. And he came to this earth, and when he was here, he faced many temptations to reject God's timing and forge his own way. Satan tempted him with prematurely displaying his glorious power, but it wasn't time. His disciples tried to get him to judge a certain city by calling fire down out of heaven, but he didn't come the first time to judge. It wasn't time for him to be the judge. He had come the first time to save. Peter tried to start a physical battle in the Garden of Gethsemane, but it wasn't time for Jesus to conquer his foes. He's going to do that one day. He's going to show up on a white horse, and he's going to conquer. But it wasn't time then. And there in that garden, Jesus prayed, not my will, but yours be done. That was Jesus submitting his life to God's plan and God's timing. And here's the incredible thing for you and me who fail at waiting well. In his waiting well, he accomplished salvation for us. So that when we realize that we don't wait well, that we sin in that way or any of the many other ways that we sin, we don't have to run from God. We can take that failure to him, confess it to him, and find forgiveness at the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ. You see, the success of Jesus at waiting well results in the salvation of sinners who fail to wait well. And then... Not only are we saved from our sin, but remember how we started? He fills us with his spirit. And so now we have no excuse, Christians. We can, as we submit to the Holy Spirit in us, we can wait well. And so we can walk out of here forgiven of our sin, of not waiting well, and ready, empowered by the Holy Spirit in us to wait well. In whatever season of waiting God may have you in. And if you're not in one right now, be patient. You'll find yourself there probably pretty soon. It's one of the ways that we get to exercise faith in our, in our God. He puts these seasons of waiting so that he can receive honor and glory. See it as an opportunity to not only have your gaze fixed upon God, but to help those around you fix their gaze upon God as they see you continuing to wait well because God is worthy of it. He is worthy of it. He's worthy of our patience. He is worthy of our faith. Let's wait well, church, for the glory of God. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, I don't know what season of waiting folks may be in today but Lord it is an opportunity to either walk away from you and your plan to not trust you or 
to look upon you and your goodness and to trust you in the midst of it. God, we confess that waiting is hard and we don't do it well. But God, thank you that you still love us, you see us, you hear us, and you graciously are willing to let us see you in the midst of our affliction and have our our attention focused back on you so that we can resist the temptation to step outside of your plan so that we can believe and trust that your way is worth the wait. God, would you help us? We need your help. We need your spirit inside of us to exercise patience, to wait well. Father, if there's someone here today who doesn't have your spirit in them because they've never believed in Jesus, the perfect one who died on the cross for their sins and rose up from the grave, they never believed in him for salvation. Lord, I pray that they would call upon your name, even right now. They would say, God, I need you. I need you to save me from my sin, and I need your spirit in me so that I can live in a way that brings you honor and glory. Lord, would you simply be honored as we seek to put into practice your word by your help and by your grace. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We're going to stand and we're going to...